you click, so these are available to you on, I posted the link on the, on the Zulip and you can open them up. There's a PDF viewer inside the Jupyter Notebook server, but if you click on the links in that PDF, just be aware it'll open a new browser tab. It won't open it as a tab inside, but you could instead just go to the EC subdirectory of the course folder and all the links are links to notebooks that are in that directory if you wanted to keep everything just in one browser tab. Okay. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? So, um, just to recap where we left off last time. So we're looking at uh, algorithms for counting points on an elliptic curve over a finite field. And uh, we looked at four different algorithms. There was a naive point counting algorithm where we were literally just counting projected points, which had uh, time complexity roughly p squared. Then we had a slightly less naive version where we took advantage of the fact that we can quickly count uh, rational roots of a polynomial over a finite field. And that brought us down to a time, running time that was quasi-linear in P. And then we looked at Ma Mestre's algorithm. A question in the back, sorry? Yeah, maybe the mic is a little low. Yeah, I'm the, okay. Hello, hello? <laughs> there are people up there that look like they're trying to do, ah, there we go, okay, now I'm loud. All right, <clears throat> let's get loud, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so now we're, going, we're uh, our first version, sort of a very dumb version of Mestre's algorithm was we took advantage of the fact that we knew we were looking for an integer in the Hasse interval, which has width on the order of, of root p, and we did just a blind linear search marching along the Hasse interval looking for multiples of orders of a point, and we took advantage of uh, Mestre's ther theorem that if we look on elliptic curve and a quadratic twist and we flip back and forth and generate enough random points, we'll eventually be able to uniquely determine the group order, and that gave us a running time that was on the order of square root of p. And then the algorithm that people actually use, and this is actually what all of these computer algebra systems are doing if you ask, it, ask them to count points over an elliptic curve over a reasonably small finite field, say anything that any word size prime, they're probably running exactly this algorithm. They're not switching over to uh, asymptotically faster algorithms yet, is to do a baby steps, giant step search on the Haas interval, which amounts to computing. So the, the width of the Haas interval is on the order of square root p, but with a baby steps, giant step search, we get a square root speed up. We compute square root of the, of the length of the linear search we're trying to do. So that's like p to the one-fourth. So it's the square root of four root p. So we have a, a p to the one-fourth baby steps, and then we march along p to the one, roughly p to the one-fourth giant steps, and, we, and when we get a collision, we know we have a multiple of the order of the point. And we can do exactly the same thing we did as in the linear ship search. We can keep marching along until we see two multiples, or if we never see two, then we know there's a unique um, a unique multiple of the, of the points order in the Haas interval. So Mestre's algorithm works exactly the same. It's just the BSGS search implements a slightly different, uh, a more efficient way of finding either the order of the point or a unique multiple of its order in the Haas interval. The downside to that is you do pay a bit on the on the sp on the space. The space complexity Im increases. There are actually O of p to the one fourth time algorithms, probabilistic algorithms that can get away with uh, quasi linear space based on Pollard row, but they're generally not used in this context because we're at a uh, baby steps, giant steps. Is the constant factors are usually slightly better, and by the time you get to the point where you would really be worried about space, you're ready to switch over to the SCA algorithm anyway. Okay. All of the algorithms we talked about yesterday work over arbitrary finite fields FQ. They're totally agnostic as to the characteristic um, and whether it's a prime field or not. But today I want to talk specifically about prime fields. So our, all of our FQs have been changed over to FPs and all of our complexity bounds are going to be in terms of P. Okay. So any questions on just the, the quick recap? We're going to see three new algorithms today. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Well, you said for small enough times. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, well, back in the old days, I'm sure there are a few people in this room who remember, that's what we did do because we didn't know anything better. So in the, in the very early days, um, when elliptic, I should have maybe mentioned one of the major motivations for a lot of these point counting algorithms was for elliptic curve crypto cryptography where it's quite important to know the order of the finite group you're going to be working in if you're using a discrete log-based cryptography. And up and people were already working towards elliptic curve cryptography in the early 80s. And at that point in time, we did not know a better method than this method for counting points, and that's what we used. Um, but then there was a major breakthrough that we're going to spend tomorrow's lecture talking about due to Rene Scoff, who came up, developed a, introduced a polynomial time algorithm. Um, at, when it was very first introduced, I'm not sure people completely realized the power of that algorithm, but now everybody does. And as we'll see tomorrow, it's quite efficient and it will blow past the fourth algorithm on this list uh, pretty early on, certainly by two to the 80th, I think would be around the crossover point. And then if you throw in um, improvements to that algorithm due to uh, no Melky, who I understand is also going to be here during the summer session, the complexity gets even better. And we'll get a chance to talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Good question, though. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't sneer at this algorithm. This algorithm is impressively fast. And as we'll see, for one of the problems we want to consider today, which is, um, suppose I have a fixed elliptic curve over Q and I want to count points on all of its reductions. In fact, even though there are asymptotically faster algorithms, um, there is no practical situation in which you would ever use them. This is always the algorithm you're going to use. And we'll see why as we, when, we get, when we come to that. Okay. All right. So I should uh, pause here to thank Sam for his excellent question yesterday, which motivated the problem set that you did in, in this morning's problem session, which was, why don't you just uh, compute, you know, think of your curve as being y squared equals f of x, and, and compute a table of squares, or test a Legendre symbol to compute the squares, and um, evaluate f. And this leads to the notion of the Hasse invariant, which you all worked with this morning in the problem session, which we could take as uh, uh, our definition, we'll take this as our definition, it's the coefficient of x to the p minus 1 in the polynomial f of x raised to the p minus 1 over 2. And some people define the Haas invariant a little more coarsely. They just say it's a thing that's either 0 or not 0, and it tells you whether your elliptic curve is super singular or not. But actually, there's a lot more information in the Haas invariant. It's going to give us uh, the trace of Frobenius, as you showed in the problem session. Um, the trace of Frobenius is congruent modulo p to the Haas invariant. And once p is bigger than 13, that's enough to uniquely determine the trace of Frobenius. Okay, so if we can compute the Haas invariant, we can compute the trace of Frobenius. And another way to think of the Haas invariant, if you're familiar with the Cartier-Manin matrix or the Haas of it matrix that you can associate to curves of arbitrary genus, uh, the Haas invariant is basically, you think of it as a one-by-one one matrix. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. It it's, it's essentially is the Cartier-Manin matrix for a curve of genus one. Okay, but we, we will just be focused on our Haas invariant, which where we have a very concrete definition. If you wanted to compute it, you could just take that polynomial, this cubic polynomial f of x, raise it to the p minus 1 over, tau, uh, over 2, go look for the coefficient of x to the p minus 1, and there's your Haas invariant. And if you stop and think about for that for a moment, you probably think that's an absolutely horrible algorithm because this, this exponentiating this cubic to the p minus 1 over 2, you're going to get something, a huge polynomial whose degree is, is linear in p. That seems like a crazy way, given the algorithms we've already seen for um, computing the trace of Frobenius. We'll come to that. But let's just note that from this definition, we can, we can the, the fact that it's congruent to the trace of Frobenius tells us a few nice things. One is, it tells us that while you might have thought maybe the definition of the Haas invariant depends on the choice of f. I mean, what if I replaced f of x with f of x plus 1? That's going to define, and that y squared equals f of x plus 1 is an isomorphic elliptic curve. You might worry that, is our Haas invariant really invariant? Well, the fact that it's congruent to the trace of Frobenius means yes, it is, because the trace of Frobenius is invariant. Okay, so all the algorithms we're going to look at today, the way they work is by computing the Haas invariant, and they, they're, but there are going to be, we're going to look at three different methods for computing it. Okay. Any questions on the setup before we get into the, start digging in? Okay. All right, so... The, or the, the motivation for the, all the algorithms we're going to present today are 
on the one hand, you know, it seems crazy to exponentiate this polynomial and then have to go find this one coefficient in this polynomial that's got, you know, p minus, you know, or, or something like 3p minus 1 over 2 of them. But there are these, po these coefficients aren't completely random. They're related. They're relations between these coefficients. And we're going to develop some linear recurrences that will allow us to, mo to, to move our, shift our focus from one coefficient of the polynomial to the next without ever having to write them all down. Okay, so how does that go? So to set things up in a very general setting, let's forget about finite fields for a moment and just suppose somebody gave us an integer polynomial, let's call it H of some degree R, and the only thing I'm going to insist on is that H has a non-zero constant coefficient. And if it doesn't, you can just shift it so that it does. So that's, not, that's without loss of generality. It'll be convenient since we're going to be looking at uh, coefficients of powers of x in some power of the polynomial. It'll be nice to have a shorthand for that. So a h sub k superscript n means the coefficient of x to the k in the nth power of h. It doesn't mean the kth, take the kth coefficient and raise it to the nth power. Those are different things, except when k is zero, when they're actually exactly the same thing. And that's a very useful fact that we're going to exploit. Okay, and if, I, if, and if you ever see an h sub k without a superscript, you should imagine the superscript is 1. I just mean the kth coefficient in h. And if you just write down two sort of mindless uh, equations, h to the n plus 1 is h times h to the n, and um, you write down the Leibniz rule for taking the derivative of h to the n plus 1, just the formal derivative of h to the n plus 1, you get two linear relations that relate to nearby coefficients of the nth power or the n or the n of the n plus first power of, of h. And if you then you know, combine these two linear relations and solve for h sub k superscript n, the coefficient of x to the k and h to the n, you get uh, a sum with r terms in it, which r is the degree of h, that involves either the co a coefficient of the initial polynomial h we were given, or other coefficients in the nth power, and not just random coefficients, but r preceding coefficients, the r coefficients with indexes less, just less than k. Okay, so this now suggests a strategy for computing h uh, k to the n, or h sub k superscript n, would be to start with h0, h sub 0 superscript n, and just